excuse me, Graduate College Peanut Gallery back there. I know you sponsor the event, but the acoustics in this room are really weird, so if you're whispering, everybody can hear it. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that that's the case. So whisper if you want everyone to hear it. Um, so anyway, we're going to get started. Uh, I apologize for the, the darkness up here, but it's necessary for the uh, this really old projector to uh, do its job. So um, so anyway, welcome to Books and Bagels. This is our first event of the year. Um, we're going to have it monthly, um, where we invite two speakers to uh, give talks. Um, and I just wanted to direct your attention to the website. So uh, this is from the Graduate College website um, on the left under Books and Bagels, Conversations on Interdisciplinary Research. You can find information about um, upcoming events, um, what, what we have described this event to be, um, and you can also um, submit to be a speaker, which is down here. Online speaker interest form. Um, so if you see the talks today and you're really excited about it, you want to talk about your own research, uh, please feel free to fill out that form and we will contact you because we have to fill more talks every month. So, please do that. Um, just in general, what we're looking for is people to give talks about their research, not super technical, not really like a conference presentation, but more of a general, this is what I'm working on and this is why you should care, um, and this is why your mom should care, and all that, all that stuff too. Um, so, we have two great speakers today. So now I'm gonna invite uh, Jerry up here to uh, talk. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Graduate College, and everybody for putting up this together. Um, as Katie rightly said, every month we shall be having this uh, conversation or talks, and uh, we encourage all of you to be part of it and talk uh, talk to this about your, uh, talk about this to your friend so that you also be part of uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, at GSA, we are trying to focus more, a little bit more, on professional development and academic event this year, and. Uh, that is our goal, and you are our partners in achieving this goal. So we're calling on all of you to be partners with us. Uh, <clears throat> so today, I don't want to take the, uh, the assignment of the, uh, of the afternoon, so I'll just go ahead and uh, introduce the, uh, the moderator for today. Uh, the moderator is uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Ryan. I call him the, the Jesus of the GSA and the uh, Dr. Organization. <laughs> <laughs> because every money, everything you need uh, from the GSA, you talk to him. Uh, sometimes don't come to me. Uh, just go talk to him, and uh, he will get everything done for you. Uh, so he is an assistant teaching professor in the College of Engineering, and he's going to be moderating all the two, uh, two presentations today. So, uh, Dr. Ryan. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I know Jerry has given me the distinction of... Um, the classification, but unfortunately, I do not think I can live up to that <laughs> classification. Um, that being said, what well, thank you all for turning up to today's our first B, um, Books and Bagels for the year. Um, we have two great presenters. It's they are going to be talking on topics that are truly inter multidisciplinary. Um, our first presenter is going to be Diksha Set. So just so before we get into the presenters, the format is going to be approximately 20, 12 minutes for each presenter. Um, please hold your questions, maybe jot down, write down as you go along until after both presenters are presented, then we will open it up for a general question and answer session. So first presenter is going to be Diksha Set. She's our final year, hopefully. We have a PhD student, no final year can be anything. She's our final year uh, PhD student in uh, uh, mechanical engineering. She is looking at engineering applications and their applications for biological systems. So a lot of times we'll be looking from the reverse, trying to mimic biological uh, um, systems and use for engineering applications. She's kind of looking at it in the reverse perspective, and how does that impact for training and uh, teaching? Big sure. Well, hello, everybody. 
everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Disha, and as Dr. Ryan introduced me, I'm from Mechanical Engineering Department, and in what I'm really hoping is driving is my final year of PhD. Uh, today I'm going to talk about biologically inspired robotics, or uh, maybe uh, that's a looser term, but what I'm really going to talk about is biologically inspired engineering, and I'm going to talk about its uh, use and application and methodologies in terms of research, which is what my PhD research was based on, uh, and also on education and how these integration can actually help us enhance education for students amongst all ages. Um, so like I said, the premise of my, my research and my educational work has been in the synergy between biology and engineering. So for, for decades now, we've looked at biologically inspired engineered systems, whether it's in flight or you know, terrestrial locomotion or swimming locomotion. But what we often oversee is how critical it is for engineered systems to actually also help biology. So, like I said, you know, we have an abundance of examples of animal-inspired robotics that are climbing walls or going through mountains and swimming in crazy environments. Uh, but what we underestimate is how important it is to develop these engineering systems to actually investigate biological hypotheses. So that's kind of where my research originated from, is that these biologists have for long have hypothesized that when a fish is starting to swim at faster speeds, it's starting to flap its tail faster. So in terms of engineering, or from an engineering standpoint, it makes sense that it also must be getting stiffer, otherwise it's putting a lot more work. Uh, but nobody has really been able to investigate that with a real living fish during natural swimming. Because as you can see here, it can take many, many, many hours to even get one proper statistically significant data from a living fish. With physiological systems like humans, we've always, we've been pretty good at communicating with them, telling them to please sit on a chair, don't use your right arm, use your left arm, but the fish you can't really talk to them unless you're Aquaman, uh, you can't really talk to fish. So it's difficult to isolate the effect of you know, flapping or flow or stiffness on the swimming performance of an animal. So biologists have had this, this need to partner with engineers to understand more about how fish swim. So my research uh, is focused on developing methodologies and equipment that can help us investigate compliance changes in a bluegill sunfish during natural swimming. For that, we use a perturbation technique where we use a small vortex ring to apply a perturbation to a fish fin as the, fin, as the fish is swimming naturally in, its, in, in the environment. And we're looking at the response of the fin in terms of deflection uh, and its deviation from natural swimming behavior to come up with an estimate of the compliance and seeing how the compliance changes with the so what you see here, or what we've seen so far, is some promising results that this technique can actually work because we're able to perturb the fish without alerting it. So it's doing its own thing, it's doing natural swimming just like you wanted to. And as the swimming speed increases, when we apply a certain strength to the fin, it starts to deflect less. It also starts to return to its original motion a lot faster. So we're starting to see these really neat relationships between swimming speed, flapping of the fin, and deflection. So now my last year's work is really focused on can we come up with a good engineering model that can you know, validate that the force applied to the fin is actually in fact constant so that we can come up with better conclusions about the stiffness. Uh, I felt like I learned a lot by working with biologists, and uh, so I worked with my advisor, Dr. James Tangora, in uh, developing and, and, and advancing a senior level engineering design course in our department, which you may have heard of as ME435, so that we can start bringing this similar experience to undergraduate students as well. There's no reason why their education has to be so isolated and studying just statics and dynamics and controls, they should be able to, they should be well versed in communicating with people from outside their field. They should also be able to take information from outside their field and learn how can I use my engineering knowledge to now make something that can explain something a lot more complex than a simple robotic system, like a biological system. There's a lot going on there. So 
We have been motivated very deeply by the constant reports from the National Science Foundation and National Science Board saying we need engineering students to be more well-versed and more interdisciplinary. Uh, we also are very involved with outreach for K through 12 students. So we want to build interest and increase awareness about engineering amongst you know, younger kids, K through 12, and also their parents who often go to museums. And you know, literature shows that people know very less about the scope of what engineers can do. Usually kids and adults just relate engineering to trucks and trains and planes and rockets, you know, but there's just so much, even if you look across the room here, there's so much more that engineers can do. Um, so my, a part of my thesis is also uh, this educational research component in which I'm coming up with, my objective is to improve education for undergrads as well as K through 12 students and develop some kind of assessment instrument. So there's really nothing out there that can measure quantitatively as we all like in our scientific community. We really don't have something that can statistically measure the changes in students' learning outcomes and interest and engagement. So I'm also coming up with an, uh, an instrument, a survey, that can, that can tease out some of these parameters. And I don't know why this keeps moving. Uh, and uh, we're also hypothesizing that this integration of bio and engineering can actually increase awareness, engagement, and knowledge about engineering amongst younger audience, so K through 12 students. Uh, we do that by partnering with museums around Philadelphia and Camden area. So our lab has for many years now partnered with three local museums, the Center of Aquatic Sciences, the Academy of Natural Sciences, and the Franklin Institute. And together through this partnership, we have used this development of bio-inspired devices to, to strengthen these partnerships. So our role here at Drexel mostly comes from the development while you know, the museum uh, educators are serving as customers, so they're gonna use the devices, uh, although there's a lot of overlap between the two. And the reason why we think this partnership has worked is because we share this common goal of K through 12 STEM outreach. Um, so this, just a little bit about the course that we teach is a 10 week, one quarter course called MM 435. So mostly Drexel mechanical engineering students in there. Very few third year, but mostly fourth and fifth year students are taking this course. Some are taking before senior design. Some are taking in, in, in simultaneously with senior design. Um, but in this course, they're developing an educational device. So a device that can teach biology and engineering in an integrated way to younger students, so K through 12 students in these three major museums. Uh, we teach them a structured process, development process, uh, developed by Ulrich and Eppinger. Uh, and in the first phase of the course, they're coming up with concepts, understanding the constraints and the needs of the device, coming up with sketches, understanding what they really want to teach, followed by then using things they're more comfortable with, like CAD and other uh, analysis tools, coming up with the detailed system design of the device. And then in the last phase of the course, these students are coming up with a functioning prototype, a focused prototype that can show that the function, that their design would indeed work if, when it's fully developed. Throughout the course, these students get to work with the educators in, uh, from the museums. So the educators come out to Drexel, they talk to the students, they tell them how they envision teaching with these devices, what the limitations are, uh, what's out there in the market, how accurate does the biology need to be. And these students, the mechanical engineering students, also get to then go to the museums and go visit the exhibits, understand what's missing from them, and how their devices that they're gonna develop in the course can actually enhance the exhibits. They also get to observe outreach lesson plans. You know, so if uh, an educator is doing an outreach with second grade kids, you know, the mechanical engineering students get to go there, take notes, observe how little students behave during an outreach class and how they perceive biology and engineering. So there's a lot of overlap with this partnership. Um, and we've used a lot of these devices that we've developed, whether they're in the prototype stage or the final device stage, and taken them to several museum events like career days or uh, you know, other outreach events and shown students, number one, how 
you can actually take a device that can teach bio and engineering. But to our surprise, not so much surprise, but we didn't go with this agenda, but we actually noticed that when you take these prototypes to these events, uh, they're not so much more interested in what the device is doing, but more about like who made this. Really, engineering students do this? They get to do that? They get to make these things? You get to study about birds? So that's really interesting, and that has really triggered another whole area of research that we're now working on with these museums is taking student interest and questions and understanding can we take the museum's existing curriculums and start integrating engineering with it? Because these museums are often teaching about, for, for example, the aquarium's often teaching about buoyancy and swimming. So can we now take that and start teaching about buoyancy and swimming forces from an engineering perspective? So that has been a really cool partnership that has come, come from this, this course. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll, okay, so I'll, I'll share a couple success stories from our students that have developed these prototypes. So a lot of our students who finish their course and get attached to it and get really good feedback from the customers then come back and work in our lab for one or two terms and now we've actually opened this up for even senior design. So if you dig 435 and you really like what you've done, you can come back in fall and start, spend a whole year really developing a robust device for these museums. Um, so some of these success stories that you see on your left is a model of an eye that teaches how the radius of curvature of a human crystalline lens helps us focus. So it shows how light converges based on the radius of curvature. We've had uh, students make a frog call game where, uh, which is currently at the Academy of Natural Science of Children Play Center, where you can uh, press a button and you'll hear a frog noise or a frog call and the students have to guess which species it is and have to turn the dials and the cliches, press the button, if it matches, the frog turns to you, if not it doesn't. Uh, we also had a team present uh, or develop a snake jaw that teaches the, uh, the structure of the snake jaw and what, what about the structure and geometry allows the snake jaw to actually unhinge and open wide enough to actually eat something bigger than its, bigger than its head. Um, this is one of our, our most successful one and most used one is a goldfish robot, which teaches the effect of temperature and swimming speed on the metabolic rate. So you have a remote control, and with the remote control you can turn up the temperature of the water, and you'll see as it gets really hot, the fish starts to swim, uh, breathe faster. And as you start to turn the other remote, it starts to swim faster, which just like we do, as a swing faster, it has to breathe faster. Um, we've, oops, so we've had uh, this buoyancy yeah, device yeah. developed before, where you can actually, you know, play around with the weight and buoyancy forces on the fish. Um, what you're seeing here is a student working with the air bladder, which is this thing that expands and, and contracts as you put air in it, and that changes the buoyancy and the weight forces, or the balance, and you can get it to neutrally buoyant, you can get it to float, you can get it to sink, so you can really start playing around with those variables. And then this device is a nautilus shell, which also teaches buoyancy, but this is a little bit more quantitative. So there's a scale attached to it, and you can really measure these forces and how pumping air into these chambers is changing the weight and buoyancy forces. Um, it's also cool because like the device kind of opens up so the educator is able to show the inside of a Nautilus shell and talk about like how, you know, when the Nautilus shell gets punctured and one of the chamber gets punctured, it's okay, it can still compensate by pumping air into the other chambers. It's just that center buoyancy changes and the weight changes. So you can really rotate these and show students some really cool phenomena. And the last one I have here is a model of an archer fish which is a fish that can keep its eyes underwater and still spit at bugs on trees. And the bug falls in the water and then the fish swims and gets it. So over these years, you know, this, this archer fish has optimized in creating this very accurate, strong projectile that kills a bug and drops it in water, but it also gets to keep its eyes underwater while it's shooting and it's very accurate. So with this, the educators teach students about refraction and adaptation and fishes. So, so overall, this theme of you know looking at or teaching engineering through this lens of biology has has been pretty promising. We get 
very interesting questions from students and, um, and all the assessments we've done on undergraduate students have shown that this integration of bio and engineering is the most challenging yet the most rewarding part of the course. They hate it in the beginning, but a lot of students really do develop an appreciation towards, you know, we're engineers. We're not going to become innovators and creative thinkers if we only learn how to communicate within our community. You're always solving a problem that's bigger for the society. You're always trying to find a solution for your customers, and you have to learn how you can get their needs and turn that into something meaningful for yourself, but also take your work and explain to them why it's meaningful to them. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions later. So we will launch into our second presentation. Our presenter is Stephanie Singer. She is a second year psychology slash law student. And she is going to be looking at some of the training programs that are being currently developed for law enforcement, for recruits. And she's looking at how they're evaluating preconceived attitudes, um, perceptions as to what trainees would think of in their interaction for youths before training and after training and oh, maybe how oh, effective these training programs are. Without further ado, Stephanie. between police officers and youth. So first I just want to give you a little bit of background information on the training I'm going to be talking about. So the purpose is to address DMC, which is Disproportionate Minority Contact. And that is the um, disproportionate representation of minority youth within the juvenile justice system. And so we can look at this at a variety of um, points within the justice system. There's actually nine that are focused on. So starting at arrest can go all the way to confinement and transfers to adult court. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the uh, point of arrest because that's what the training is designed to um, address. So you might be wondering to what extent does DMC exist in Pennsylvania? And one way that it's measured is using the relative rate index, or RRI. So this will compare the rate at which white youth are arrested with the rate at which minority youth um, are arrested to give you a sense of the differences between the two. So the RRI for white youth is a standard 1.0. And in Pennsylvania, the RRI for minority youth is 2.92. So what this means is that minority youth are arrested almost three times as much as white youth. It's slightly lower for black youth in particular, but they're still arrested at over twice the rate of white youth. So this doesn't necessarily indicate a bias in policing. There could be a number, number of other factors that um, cause these rates to be different, but it does indicate a disparity that we need to look into further. So next we can ask, what is being done to address DMC? Um, this is the Juvenile Justice um, and Delinquency Prevention Act, which requires states to um, address DMC and the causes of it. So Pennsylvania is one of those states, and I'm sorry that overlaps. Um, so the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency created a DMC subcommittee, and their role was to address DMC within Pennsylvania. So one thing that they did was create this curriculum called the Pennsylvania DMC Youth Law Enforcement Curriculum. And this is what's implemented at the trainings that I'm going to discuss. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. But um, overall, the training was first implemented in 2007 in Philadelphia. In 2009, they made it part of the Philadelphia Police Academy's recruit training. So what that means is that every single class of recruits that goes, to the, goes through the police academy gets this training. And so to date, they've trained over 2,500 police officer recruits. So the curriculum was developed through a collaborative approach with a um, number of different organizations, so try and focus on the bubbles at the top. Um, so this includes the Defender Association, the District Attorney's Office, different law enforcement agencies, 
um, juvenile probation, other faith-based and community organizations, and some other juvenile justice um, stakeholders. So the primary goal of the training is to help officers understand youth. Um, and so the training has two formats. There's one eight-hour training, or there's a shorter four-hour training. That's the one I'm going to focus on and tell you about, because that's the one that's been implemented in Philadelphia. That's better. So the first part of the training is an interactive lecture on adolescent development. And this is given only to the police recruits. Um, so they really learn about the development of the adolescent brain and how this might impact adolescent behaviors in terms of them being more impulsive and acting more based on emotions as opposed to logic and reasoning, which we would more typically see once their brain has been more developed as it is in adults. And I say this is interactive because the recruits will engage in a number of different activities. Um, so they get up and move around. It's not just a straight lecture. So the second part is a panel discussion. And so the panel consists of experienced law enforcement officers and youth from the community. And they actually sit every other up on stage. And then you have other youth from the community who are sitting in the audience along with um, the recruits. And so the panel discussion is moderated by George Mosey, who's the first assistant district attorney here in Philadelphia. And so it's really just an opportunity for youth from the community and these recruits to engage in really candid discussions about relationships between the two groups, um, different perceptions that they have of one another. They talk a lot about stereotypes, um, different perspectives, and they also will engage in a number of role plays. So for example, um, George Mosey will have four recruits line up, and he'll have four youth who are wearing hoodies line up. He'll have them put the hoodies over their heads, stick their hands in their pockets, and he'll say, okay, go walk through that line of recruits. And then he'll talk about how did that feel for you as a youth? How did that feel for you as an officer um, to really get out to, I guess, hash out how you're um, perceiving these individuals when you see them on the street. Then he'll say, okay, take your hands out of your pockets, take your hoodie off, and now walk through those group of officers. Um, and again, they'll talk about, okay, how was that different from the first time? How did you make that, how did that make you feel? Did you feel more safe, less safe? Um, so that's just an example of one role play that's done. So after the panel, they'll break out into smaller groups of probably 10 to 12 individuals. Again, it's a mix of recruits and youth, and it's a facilitated discussion by a moderator, um, really to continue the discussion that they have during the panel, maybe go a little bit more in depth, um, have it be a little more personal. Um, and finally, the recruits and the youth have lunch. So it's just an opportunity for them to break bread, sit down and eat together, and talk to one another um, as human beings. Talk about basketball, or the weather, or the election, and what's going on. It's a really great part of the um, program that occurs. So in terms of where the curriculum is being delivered, as I mentioned, it started in Philadelphia, but it has expanded or um, is expanding soon to a number of other counties in Pennsylvania. So this gives you an idea of what those counties are. So um, Drexel got involved with the DMC committee because they asked us to kind of ramp up the evaluation procedures that were being done for the training. They had implemented surveys, um, but they did pre-post and administered both at the end of the training, which we know as researchers, that's not a very good idea. Um, so we changed the structure of how they administered their surveys, and we also revised and added in a number of different questions to them. So I'm gonna, basically going to be presenting some data from um, about 170 recruits who have taken these surveys as part of the training so far. So in general, there's three different types of questions that we ask on the surveys. Uh, the first type asks about attitudes and beliefs. So for example, relationships between police and young people can be improved. And this is scored on a one to five scale. We also ask the recruits about behavioral intentions. So for example, when you interact with young people, how likely are you to explain to the young person why you stopped him or her? And this is also on a one to five scale. And lastly, we ask them questions about the workshop in general. So for example, today's program should be cared with, shared with other police departments across the country. And again, this is on a one to five scale. Um, so like I said, we have data right now from about 170 recruits. Um, the average age is around 26, 27. A majority of the recruits are male, but about a quarter are female. And we have a somewhat diverse sample. A uh, majority is white, but we do have almost a quarter who are black and about 10% who are Hispanic. So jumping into the attitudes and beliefs, 
Um, so post-training, significantly more recruits agreed or strongly agreed that relationships between police and youth can be improved. And where we see the biggest difference is the number who said that they strongly agreed with this statement. We also see significant differences in those who said that race or ethnicity affect interactions with police and youth, um, that police often overreact when dealing with youth, and that police have a role to play in keeping youth out of the juvenile justice system. So in general, we see this increasing awareness of the role that race and ethnicity plays. Um, we also see that police have a feeling that, they, that things can get better and they have a key role in that. Um, one thing to note is that only about half are recognizing the importance of race in these relations. One hypothesis that I have is because the majority of the recruits are white, they might not necessarily see the effect that race has. Um, so once we get more participants, I think it'll be interesting to see if that effect differs by race. A few other attitudes and beliefs that we saw improved significantly pre to post training um, were that post training recruits were more likely to say that they agreed or strongly agreed youth are often afraid when interacting with police, but there are techniques that they can use to make stopping youth safer and that they trust the youth living in their district. So we see here an increasing understanding of a youth's perspective and a feeling of having control over the situation and being able to diffuse it. Um, so we'd like to think that some of these results are come from that adolescent development module that they're given at the beginning of the training. So next, jumping into the behavioral intentions. Um, recruits reported significantly after the training that they probably or definitely would approach a youth differently than they would an adult. And you see again the difference from those who strongly agree pre and post. And to try to talk to one youth at a time away from the group. So these are also key takeaways from the adolescent development module, so we hope that as a result of that training, that's where these results are coming from. Um, this is just a quick slide to show some of the other behavioral intentions that didn't have significant findings pre to post. It's clear because the recruits indicated um, pretty strongly at the beginning that they would already do some of these techniques. So these are other ones that are taught during the training um, that are specific to youth as opposed to adults. Um, and lastly, this is a slide on different workshop opinions. I know there's a lot up there, so I'm not going to go through them all, but I just wanted to highlight some for you all. Um, so a significant majority of the officers said that they would use the information that they learned during the training in their work and share it with fellow officers. Also, a large percentage thought that this curriculum should be shared with other youth around the country and also the police departments across the country. We see about two-thirds so that they felt more prepared to interact with youth. Um, which is definitely a result that we'd like to see. I think you would definitely want to see it higher. Um, so an investigation as to why um, that is lower, maybe what could be done at the training to improve this result would definitely be useful. And a high percentage, 82%, said that they'd like to engage in more positive activities with youth in the community, which is another positive finding that they, we were really happy to see. So to conclude, I just wanted to give you some limitations of the study so you understand it within those contexts and also talk about future directions so you have an idea of where this research is going. So one limitation is that these surveys were self-report and it was done with recruits, so they have very limited field experience. We don't actually know what they are going to do when they are out on the street. Um, so to counter that, we like to look at their actual behavior. So whether this is coding the body cam data um, or just looking at like hard police data, different arrest records and things like that to get a sense of does the training actually influence their behaviors in addition to their thoughts and beliefs. We also didn't have a control group. As I mentioned, um, the training is, a, is mandatory for all of these recruits. Um, so adding a control group in somehow would be really helpful, whether that's if the training's ever revised, having a control group at that point, or trying to find a police department across the country who's relatively similar and being able to compare um, behaviors that way. Also, we only um, engaged in short-term follow-up, so the post-surveys were administered immediately after the training. So some sort of long-term follow-up would be helpful, whether it's after a couple of months, after a year, to see if these changes persist across time. And lastly, this data is only from Philadelphia, but as I mentioned, the training is being implemented or will be implemented in um, a number of other counties across PA. So it would be really interesting to compare the data and see if those counties are experiencing um, the same effects that we are seeing in Pennsylvania, or in Philadelphia. Um, so thank you very much for your attention.
questions, anyone with questions, you can tell me. Yes, So my first question is for Stephanie. Have you heard the about the 
contestants? Are you doing this on the same kind of fish? Uh, yes, so my studies are focused on the bluegill sunfish, uh, which honestly I think just kind of that's the fish we chose because we do all of our fish studies at the Harvard University with the biologists there, and it's just really easy to catch them in the last. <laughs> Just to follow up to that, which may also boils to age, I'm assuming that the participants that you're using are youths. Mm -hmm. Did you maybe try the difference with now 20 year olds dressing up in hoodies approaching police and see what happens? Um, we didn't. I, and I'm trying to think if we do give surveys to the youth, they get a similar pre and post survey. Um, so we do have the fall textures to focus on the recruits for today. Um, and I think the average age of the participant is closer to that, like 17, 18 okay. um, range. So, and I, um, I guess it's too, it might be like hard to tell with the hoodie really what the age mm -hmm. of the person is walking up to these stories. Okay. But no, we haven't tried it with older. Older people. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Katie? So you're getting your PhD and JD. <laughs> Either work with Alice. 
coming to that question then, and this goes for both of you, in terms of your experience. You dealt with um, 20K, is that right? And you also dealt with undergrads. So what was the biggest challenge in dealing with both groups and which one? I noticed you were saying you wanted to get into university. Is that a result of your experience with these two groups? <laughs> Tweaking the question a little bit differently for Stephanie in terms of your experience with the groups you're working, you are looking at preconceived um, attitudes before and after training. What do you consider would have been the biggest uh, attitude that maybe get the biggest change and the one that was hardest to change? It's, it's okay, just, I, I'm kind of also, you see these things on the news on a regular basis, so I'm trying to see what your training, um, what your findings would have said would have been. Yeah, but I not, mean, there's not definitely, sorry, there were like a number of variables that we didn't see um, significant findings, so I, I can definitely like take a look and you know, some of those, I just like having difficulty remembering off the top of my head, but. Yeah, did not mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> just asking for my interest first thing. Any other questions we may have? Uh, in the interest of time, one more question from the audience, if there's any. Nope, I think we're good. Um, do you have any questions you want to ask each other? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, if not, I think we could call it okay for today. And uh, when is the next? Yeah. Yes, well, let's conclude real quick. Okay. Um, so let's thank our speakers one more time. Um, and just a reminder, we'll have another one December 2nd. Yep. Um, and it'll be here. It'll be at noon. And uh, we'll have two different speakers. If you want to be one of them, fill out that form. Um, and uh, I hope you guys can tell your friends about this event. I think it went really well today. So. Thank you again. And uh, we have some certificates um, and gifts for our speakers. Um